you're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. And we will be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we have as our guest Paul Vallis. He has just entered officially the race for mayor. We're taping this on May 3rd. Yesterday, he made it official. Everybody knew Paul was running. We have now Rahm Emanuel facing seven opponents, including Paul Vallis. So, Paul, what we're going to do here, do this little tell our views too. We're going to do what they do for PhD prelims, or at least they used to at the University of Chicago. They gave people true, false, or uncertain exams. Zero credit if all you did was put down true, false, or uncertain. What counts is your answer. Same thing here. If Paul just says true, false, or uncertain, we give you zero credit, okay. Mr. Alice. But if you come up with a good answer, the viewers get to decide how much credit you get all on right. this exam, okay? And so... Here's good, because we're talking about education. Come back more about Paul later, but everybody knows him. He's a well-known commodity in the city of Chicago. So what we want are the issues, and Rahm, our mayor, set this in 2011. He said major issues are education, public safety, violence, city finances. 2015, he said, I think, same thing, right? Right. 2019. I mean, we're running. He's running in 2018. It's still issues. Is it still those three things, Mr. Bell? Yeah, pretty much. So, uh, look, the, the underlying challenge is financial because uh, obviously, if you don't have your financial house in order, it impacts everything: education, public safety, infrastructure, etc. So, those issues remain the same. But you know, but you need an underlying uh, uh, f uh, financial planning strategy that in effect uh, um, transforms the budget into a long-term financial plan to make the investments in those areas to address the, those issues identified as being the major issues. The investment in public safety, the investment in infrastructure, the investment in education. So everything emanates from the budget. Everything emanates from the long-term financial plan. But those issues are the same. Uh, the issues are the same. You know, the, the city has now gone um, um, the city and the schools are in constant financial crisis, and they're not out of the crisis yet. Uh, we have more murders in the city than uh, L.A. and New York combined. Our infrastructure is decaying, particularly our neighborhood infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, and schools are in decline, particularly when you look at not only the constant instability uh, that the schools are experiencing, but when you look at the decline in enrollment. Uh, you know, the schools have, have uh, continued to bleed students, and, and that's having an adverse impact on the financial condition of the schools, given the fact that the state funds the schools based on their enrollment and their average daily attendance. So the issues remain the same, <coughs> unresolved, and I think in, 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 in the most cases actually getting worse rather than getting better. So people have just gotten a glimpse, in case you missed it, of Paul Vallis, because... He started out. He started out doing revenue for the city of Chicago, doing budget for the city of Chicago. So that was his genesis, 95 to 2001. He was the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. I won't trace it out, but for the last 15 or 16 years, he then continued on a variety of places, at Philadelphia, New Orleans, Haiti. More crisis management, more education issues, more problem solving. Well, I, I, Did I get that right? You, you, Is that a suck up enough answer for it, that's you? A, a question. My because mother would I'm love trying that to compete answer. with all the media who, no, we're going to ask you some challenging answer. questions. He will. He always does. But this this does give people seriously but let me say, a sense of who you are. But let me say one thing. Uh, I actually was attracted to public service. I, I'm, you know, I, I, I was a certified teacher. But I, uh, my first job was a teaching job. Uh, I was a school teacher. Uh, the, uh, uh, my first foray into governmental service, uh, non-teaching service, I'm talking about government, state, local government, was I, I was hired by Phil Rock, uh, the late uh, and great uh, Phil Rock, Senate, Senate President, and, and, and I worked uh, in the Senate uh, and then later for the state legislature as a whole for Don Clark Netch. So I staffed the Revenue Committee for Don. Uh, for four years. So you get it in terms exactly. of... Exactly. So my start was actually working for Don Clark Netch for almost 10 years before being recruited okay. to the city of Chicago by, uh, by uh, Mayor Daley. So you heard people say budgets are important because they set priorities. 
priorities are important because they give you sort of a long-term plan, which you alluded to. That's right. So enough with the okay. easy stuff. Let's go to the hard stuff. All right. True, false, or uncertain. Okay. School choice, including school vouchers, charter schools, virtual charter schools, homeschooling, magnet schools, traditional neighborhood schools, international baccalaureate, are good choices not for everybody, but they're good for being able to improve education. So the short question is, true, false, or uncertain, school choice, including school vouchers, et cetera, are good on average to have. True, false, or uncertain. Start that way and then you can explain. Uh, uncertain, uh, you know, uh, because, you know, I believe school choice is good, but I'm not a supporter of, of vouchers. Uh, so You know, you told me that. Next time, if you like, we'll play the tape. Sure. You once told me you've always been a supporter of school vouchers. Do you deny that? No, no. What I say is I support school choice, but I, but I don't support uh, vouchers uh, when, when the voucher programs take money away from traditional public schools. Did you tell me at various points of your career you support school vouchers, yes or no? I, I said I support school choice. No, but no, I'm, I asked you about school vouchers. Please answer that question. Yeah, you know, I don't recall. Did you, you don't recall saying that? Yeah, I don't recall what I had told you many, many years ago. Not many, many years well, ago. Well, you're asking me what I support. Three years Do ago, I, four years ago. So you no longer right. support school vouchers is what you're saying. You know, I support making sure that public schools are funded adequately, and they're not. And you don't think school vouchers... I don't want to spend too long on this, but it's an important point. Second question, uh, true, false, or uncertain, okay. schools competing for students is a good thing. Well, I think schools... True, false, or uncertain? Well, yes, it's a good thing. It's true. And now explain why it's a good thing. Well, you know, first of all, I believe that, uh, that you need to have school choices, and I think you can have school choices within the context of public schools. So, so charter so, schools, in a, so for example, charter schools, you're saying, well, should, is that within the context well, of public schools? Well, there's different types of school in choices. In CPS, in no, no, CPS. Let me answer the question. Okay. You're asking okay. the question. Let me give you an answer. Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me tell you about the type of school choice that I support. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, first of all, you know, I support charter schools as long as charter schools are held to the same standards as traditional public schools, as long as they're open enrollment, as long as there's strong accountability, okay? So, so the bottom, and, and, and as long as you're not, you know, uh, opening so many charter schools that you don't create overcapacity, which hurts both charter schools and public schools alike. So for example, uh, when I was at, in the Chicago Public Schools, we opened 15 charter schools. They now have 122 charter schools. So, and approximately how many of the 390,000 students are currently in charter schools? Uh, you know, approximately. Do you have a you know, ballpark? I, I'm not sure. It, it, it's 15%. probably... 15%. Yeah, you know, maybe 15... To 20, maybe, 15%, yeah, 60,000 or so. Third. It's quite a bit of, since right. you've but left the, here. Quite right. a bit of growth. But the point is, as the system was shrinking, they were opening more and more schools. And as, as indicated, for example, if you look at the Detroit charter movement or if you look at other cities that have provided... Uh, you know, uh, for the unlimited opening of charter schools, both charter schools and traditional schools are all academically failing. You look at the Detroit schools, both the charter schools and the traditional public schools are all failing. And part of the reason is there's well, two... in Chicago in, or in in Detroit. Chica no, let's go to Chicago for a second. In CPS, would you say it's currently true that traditional schools and charter schools are currently failing? No, no, what I'm saying Talk is... Talk about those two things in Chicago right now. What I'm... Charter schools, you can come back to your point. What please. I'm saying, uh, no, no, the, the, okay. the important okay. is a point one. When okay. you uh, there's an important one. When you create overcapacity, schools suffer because they can't implement their models. So, like, like okay. happened in Detroit. You're saying that's happened now they in Chicago? Yeah, I, I think all, I believe that all the schools have struggled, non-charters and charters alike, because you have schools, uh, you know, the majority okay. of schools that are not at full capacity. So the point is overcapacity hurts all okay. schools. But on your issue of school choice, uh, you, you can't create school choice within the traditional public school construct too. And let me give you an example. You can put, when I was in the Chicago Public Schools, we opened a, a series of magnet high schools. But what we did was, our goal was to magnetize neighborhood schools and then allow the students to, to, uh, to select the neighborhood magnet 
school program uh, to attend to. So we opened 15 international baccalaureate academies that we put in 15 neighborhood high schools. We did our military academies. We did our, our uh, we called them AP academies, advanced placement academies. We did our, our world language academies, et cetera. So, so our goal was okay. to magnetize neighborhood schools and then to allow students to pick among those neighborhood schools. And those programs were highly successful. So there's a mix and match. There's a mix and match when it comes to school choice. Okay, we gotta go on because that's yeah. an important topic, yeah. but we're gonna hit, yeah. we're gonna hit, we've hit education, we're gonna hit violence, we're gonna hit economic development, yeah. we're gonna hit finance, finances. I promise you, you're gonna cooperate. Yeah. We're gonna hit no, all no, those No, 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 I understand. Things. But, okay. uh, but you know, let me say one more thing too. You, you wanna go on. No, no, no. You're, 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 te you're taking away time from I know, those other topics. I know, but it's really important. Okay. You, know, uh, you know, my position has been not to oppose or try to kill legislation to uh, expand choice for children. But when it comes That's to- That's what New Orleans was all about, wasn't uh, it? Well, uh, the decision in New Orleans was to create a network of independent, of independent schools to replace the corrupt school right. system for And they Katrina. were often private, and they were often voucherized, and they were often charters? No, 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 they, they weren't. No, they were they all- They weren't voucherized? No, no, they, they weren't. They, uh, New Orleans, or the state, created a voucher program, which incidentally was not successful. Okay. But, but the, New the school district that I ran, the school district that we created through the recovery school district, the mandate by the Democratic governor and, in, in effect, the Democratic leadership uh, was to create a district of independent schools where each and every one of the schools would be able to secure their own independence and autonomy from the state. So of the first 17 schools to go to the state to secure charters, 14 of those schools were public schools. So the desire was to make sure that every single public school, all open enrollment, uh, non-for-profit schools, that, that okay. those schools be, be, be autonomous and that the money to those schools flow directly to the schools and not be who intercepted controlled, by central Who office. controlled the choice? Who controlled the purchasing power? The students? You? The state? Who exercised no, that choice? The individual the parents? schools. No, the, oh, so the parents had no choice no, in, no, 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 no choice in, in say about this? No, no. Well, first it's of important all... Point. First of all, all the schools in New Orleans are governed by an elected school board. Okay. Okay, so there is an elected school board in New Orleans, and all the schools, charters, not charters okay. alike, are governed okay. by that board. But, but, this is important, all right? 98% of the money, 98% of the money flows directly to the individual schools. It's not intercepted by the, the central schools. office. And not intercepted by the students. It, it's, it goes to the schools to be used in the classroom. But so the schools, get, but students schools don't get have control choice. of their budget. Uh, uh, so, uh, it's news to everybody. A no. lot of people think this. But we'll have to go on. We can come okay, back right. another okay. show. Okay. We have a little difference of opinion here. That's good, right? That's okay. Yeah, that's healthy. It's good, right? <laughs> We're hoping to create a system, a model for the eight candidates, including Rom. Start by coming on this show, as Willie Wilson has, as now Paul Vallis has. We invite the other six candidates. If we you haven't heard from me, you get in touch. And we're going to have discussion. And then we're going to do another round. And we're going to have so much discussion of ideas like this. We'll be bound to get solutions. And the city is bound to make the best choice choice mm -hmm. among you eight people who they think can run the people. Hey, the absolutely. City. OK, that's where okay. we're going. All right. So, Violence, homicides, murders, everybody knows. We'll skip the true, false, uncertain. It wasn't working so well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's try another way. No. Okay, that's no, okay. Okay, everybody knows in 2017, excuse me, in 2016, Chicago went off the charts in murders, in homicides, in major crimes, right? Right. I'm not, everybody knows that. Yes. And then in 2017, it started coming down, but not all the way down. I mean, the short question is, what the hell is happening? Are there murders just rampant in 2016? And this wasn't happening in Los Angeles, and this wasn't happening in New York. Well, these are the facts. The facts are... We, what are the facts? The facts are we have more murders than New York and L.A. combined. And, and, and to say that it's cyclical, well, New York had... A recent report came out that said since New York's peak in, what was it, 1997, 1998, I don't know, uh, when they had 2,200 murders... And last year they had less than 300. There's been almost a 90% decline in murders, wow, wow. and it's a continual decline. So what have they been doing uh, to result in a continued decline 
uh, in, in, in violent crime, particularly murders. Uh, it sustained the climb. Because this whole idea, now it's election year, big push, you know, murders are down. What's going to happen next year? They're going to go up again? They're up, they're down, they're up, they're down. You know, the problem So with, what's the solution? Okay. What is the solution? We, we only got about 14 minutes left. Well, very quickly. What's the solution? Very qu quickly. There's You're the problem solver. There's an absence of, uh, of consistent and sustained support for the police department. When I was a city budget director, I put 13,500 police officers on the street. Uh, what did they drop down to six or seven years ago? 11,000, I think, uh, or something like that. Something like that. Uh, he was uh, hoping to get know. it up back to 12,000. Right. In fact, the mayor... You were, you were at 13,500 13,500. The mayor took something like 2,000 positions out of the police budget. Now, granted, some of them may have not been filled, or many of them may have not been filled, right. but the point is they were there for a reason, and at one point they had been filled. So the bottom line is... So we need more coppers. Uh, uh, second... Uh, let me give you a second example. And, and this, like no, this okay. is important. Okay. They used to have 1,200. At, at one time, they had 1,200 detectives. They had gutted the detectives' budget to where they had, depending on the numbers, like between yeah. 600 to 800. Okay. I've heard okay. different numbers. Yeah. Now they're building back. But when, when you look at only one out of every six murders, uh, somebody being arrested, somebody being brought to trial, uh, that tells you that we've got a serious problem. So what needs to be done is the police... Need to, need to have the resources and support they need, and those resources and those supports need to be sustained over time. That's, how you, that's how you bring down crime. Okay. Strategic decision support centers, you've heard of those? Yes. I think, that, I think Eddie Johnson refers to them as SDSCs. Yeah. What are they about? Yeah. Are they you effective? Know, I, Would you continue them? Is he onto something yeah, here? Yeah, you, know, you know, I'm not going to second guess his strategy uh, I am going to second guess him not being provided the resources to operate effectively. But he says, I saw him only a few weeks ago at the City Club. He's, he said the mayor is doing this. He's giving us the resources we need. We needed this technology. This is bringing it down. This is working. Look, do you was he lying? Would you fire Eddie Johnson and get somebody in who would well, tell you the truth? All, I, or would you keep him there and say, hallelujah, You're Eddie. using up your 14 minutes that are left by, yes. uh, by not letting me answer the question. Yes. Uh, first of all, Eddie Johnson is a fine police officer. And I have no doubt that technological innovations can be effective, but there's no substitute for having enough officers. Right now, the mayor is scrambling to hire officers. They're running double shifts. What happened during the first five, six year period? You, you can't drop down into the 11,000s and then suddenly as it gets close to election year, go back up to 13.5. If you have Eddie Johnson, uh, could he do a better job with a sustained force of 13,500, with a solid and growing police patrol, with 1,200 detectives, with five detective divisions as opposed to three, consistency, consistency, continuity, sustainability, he would tell you with his, uh, with his, his innovative uh, police approaches, with the right resources, with the right resources, he could be very effective. Right now, they're okay. pulling police from certain communities and they're sending them to Michigan Avenue and to Lakeshore okay, Drive because it. there's been a spike in crime and they're sitting okay. in cars. They're sitting in cars just to establish a presence. There is no substitution for sustained support for, for your police department, for providing the support so that all the communities have adequate police resources. And when you need additional units, you're not drawing from communities, but rather you have the, those flex units that you can then deploy. Okay, before we go on to another topic, <laughs> no, seriously, okay. is I think people out there, and I hope they got what you said, it's an mm -hmm. important point, I'm not going to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that, and additionally, that needs to be done to lower the violence, lower the murders, make this city safer. Yeah, well, well, look, and it, there's always, I try not to be condescending in my Guns, answers. we haven't mentioned guns. Right. But, but, Should but, you talk about but guns? But let's talk about economic opportunity. Okay, okay. When you go to the Rolls and Pullman area, uh, uh, I've heard statistics as high as 50, 60 percent of, of the men in, in the community being in some phase of the criminal justice system. I mean, the bottom line is you, you have TANF, you have chronically unemployed, you have ex-offenders, you have, uh, you have, uh, 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 displaced veterans, etc., uh, individuals who not only do not have the, do, do not have any employment prospects or or don't have the skills if those employment opportunities presented themselves, they are out there, 17 to 40 years old, 50 years old. They're out there. They they outnumber the high school students in many cases. So so you want to get at crime? Let's have a strategy for getting at that population for providing the adult ed and occupational training skills that they need. You know, I, I, I mentioned suddenly we have $2.5 billion for Amazon. Great. I'm, I'm saying we should go after the, 
the big, right. the big prizes, right. you know, the big prizes. But if we had two and a half billion dollars to spend, two and a half billion dollars billion, to spend, billion, with a B. billion, yeah. billion dollars to spend, uh, uh, state and local money, uh, to offer th those array of incentives. What about the mini Amazons? What about small, uh, smaller businesses or existing businesses that could have expanded if they had gotten those type of incentives? I mean, why weren't if we had that type of largesse to invest? Why weren't we investing it in our communities? So it's just a question of priority. So I don't oppose Amazon. I mean, that that the horse is out of the barn on that one. And obviously, we hope we get Amazon. Let's make sure that the people that they're hiring are our are, are city residents. But the point to be made here is what happened the last seven years? What happened the last seven years? Why do we build a Wintrust Arena, a Wintrust Arena, McCormick Place, uh, for DePaul, incidentally, for, and when DePaul's, what, six, eight miles away, when Jerry Reinsdorf would have given DePaul the United Center to use for free, and we build a $175 million arena, we, we steal $100 million from the TIF funds. TIFs are supposed to be used in the hard press areas. Meanwhile, Chicago State University gets nothing from the city, uh, uh, and and the Rosen Pullman community, the whole South so why, Side. Why do we do that? I don't know. Answer because your of, question. You asked why? why. Why does Rom do those things? If you're right, and I'm not saying is Rom can come on and defend himself, but if you're right, if he's been doing this kind of stuff for six or seven years, that is not having. It sounds like you're saying not having a concerted, thoughtful program that helps and assists developing business and jobs across the board. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Once in a while he drops in and says, Amazon, here's two and a half billion. Right, uh, election yeah. year, it's great. You're saying, you should, why isn't he doing that? Because is he a bad guy or he doesn't know? Because what's I the just problem? Think, well, you know, first of all, I, I think what we have in Chicago is kind of a Washington, D.C. approach to politics. It's all about the election. It's all about uh, the next election, it's all about gearing up for the next election, it's all about fundraising, it's all about raising enough money to scare any potential opponent out of the race. Look, how many stories are all about who's raised how much money for what? Right. You know, as if we're keeping a scorecard. If you raise more money, but you're not here. Here candidate. we're talking issues. Yeah. So we're going to. So that's issues. your point. So my point is, I think there's this Washington, D.C. approach to things. Okay. I also think that fundamentally, fundamentally, I mean, does Rom really even understand the neighborhoods? I mean, is he a neighborhood guy? Does he really? Is he, does he realize that he, Chicago? He, he grew strength? up in Wilmette. He started here in the city, but he grew up in Wilmette, so he never really got it. Is that what you're saying? Well, he should have stayed in the city. I think the absence going I think, to Nutria West. So, I think the absence know. of a comprehensive strategy towards revitalizing the neighborhoods. Look, the West Side. There, there are areas of the city that have not recovered. Okay. From, from the last recession, some areas of the West Side haven't recovered from 60 years. Well, let me rise. go there. Let me go but there. But there's no strategy. You want to no go policy. there. Let me take, we've okay. only got four or five minutes, so okay. we're going to do two uh, well, topics. We can add two topics at one. Okay. Okay. But you can come back, right? Promise. Uh, of course. Okay. Yeah, okay. of course. But these are two key topics. All right. Let's see if you can blend it. I'll just say it very succinctly. You figure it out. All right. La Laquan McDonald. What happened? What does it mean? What did Rom do? What should he have done? What would you have done if you were the mayor? Five questions about Laquan McDonald. You got them all. And does that relate to the fairness issue that Willie Wilson talks about? Maybe you'll be talking about, you know, these contracts. They kind of don't go to proportionally to minorities. We have these programs set up, and respond. they don't work. So the two things, Laquan McDonald, police and all that stuff, and then just the whole fairness issue that you alluded to with neighborhoods and economic development, go. Look, this is the issue on Laquan McDonald. If he didn't know, uh, you know, if he knew about the tape, then he lied. If he didn't know about the tape, then he's, he's, he's incompetent. Because at the end of the day, when I was at the Chicago Public Schools, I got reports seven days a week. And on any violence uh, impacting any of our children, even with, when they were not on school, and I took action, and I assessed the situation, and I got to the bottom of what the problem was, and I did my crisis intervention, and I took a hands-on approach. So the bottom line is, if he didn't know, if he didn't see the tape, he should have seen the tape, and he should have made the tape public. But, but there's a pattern and then of what? denial. And then, so you would have done that. You would have seen the tape. You would have, you would have known two or three weeks after. There's I would a tape. have been you say, you, you say you took a look at the tape. You've seen it now. What would you have done right then? What's the old... Look, what look, would you have done? Just tell the us. Old, what's the old... 
I, I'll tell you exactly what I would have done. What I would have done is I would have been honest and transparent with the public. When I was CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, anytime there was a crisis in the school, and you know this, anytime, violence in the school, who was doing the interview? Who was, who was doing the interview one at a time? Sometimes on the front lawn of my house, it was okay. me explaining okay. the situation. So the bottom line is you have to trust the, if the public trusts you, you know, they're going to, they're going to be forgiving. They're going to be okay. more receptive when you're transparent, when you're honest and open, and there's been an absence of that. But you don't only see it there. You see it with the $20 million no-bid contract to the Soups Academy, or you see it. At CPS, uh, the board see, gave right. a no-bid contract. Yeah, they gave a no-bid contract. And the board is the there, Ron put it there. there. That's wrong. Yeah. So at the end of the day, Forrest I didn't Claypool, know about that's it. Wrong, right? Right? Or, okay. or, or look, the Sodexo contract, right? Okay. Uh, Sodexo gets failing marks, 73%. Rom expressed his absolute outrage at what happens. And then, like, the next day or the next week, they award Sodexo okay. a $267 million contract okay. extension. Go to the other issue. It's key. You only got okay. a few minutes yeah, left. Yeah, sorry. What was the other issue again? Well, I'll say it to you real quick, okay? Oh, so Laquan, economic opportunity. Uh, uh, just, Laquan McDonald, we know, was <coughs> African-American. We know he shot by a white copper. We know race is an issue. Maybe it wouldn't have happened. Maybe it would have if he had been a white kid. But if you're sitting there in the south side or the west side, and you're seeing a lot of killings going on, you see a guy shot 16 times in six seconds needlessly, and he happens to be a 16 year old African-American kid. And you see African-Americans, as someone told that, the highest unemployment in, and, and the African-American unemployment rate in Illinois is higher than anywhere else in the country. Can you, here's the question, and then you can answer for a few minutes. Right. Can you, Paul Vallis, one of three white candidates, the other five are African-American, can you identify and deal with the African-American concerns I've just Mentioned. Well, let me point out, because we have limited time to respond, you yeah. know, let me just say once again, you, you've got a, this massive population of 17 to 4-year-olds that are basically at the tan of the chronically unemployed, the ex-offenders, right. and you need a strategy. You need a education tier that focuses on the 17 to 4-year-olds. And as you know, uh, uh, over the past, uh, 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 I spent a year and a half working with Sally Yates and the Justice Department, U.S. Attorney General. Tell them about uh, it. On, on, looking at the whole issue of education and occupational training for just this group of individuals, particularly ex-offenders. Ex and, and, and there are yeah. things that you can do. There are things that you can do to make a difference. So you've got to provide, you can't say you're, they're out of school, they're ex-offenders, they're on the street, we can't do anything about it, and continue to just focus on the K-12. to We've got to focus on the 17 to 40-year-olds, and there are opportunities, and there are actually federal funds. We all, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funds, et cetera, work for, uh, workforce uh, uh, tax credits that are available that you can take advantage of to fund those very programs. So that's number one, and this is really quick. Number two, the city is a huge you got economic- a minute. You got a minute. It's a huge economic engine. There's no reason why the city can't dispense its resources in a more equitable manner. So let me give you an example. When I did the $3.2 billion school construction program, I took all of our, uh, I took the projects out of the political bu public building commission and I allocated 50, over 50% 50 of all the contracts, the, the hiring, uh, okay. and the end, you know, and, uh, to, to minority and women-owned businesses, 50% of those hired needed to be minority, 50% need to be city residents. We exceeded those numbers. Okay. So my point is there are things that you can do to stimulate economic, uh, uh, to expand economic opportunities in well, the inner we, city. Well, we did a whole show. I hope you'll watch it. It's okay. on there. A safe haven. You may have heard of it. It's out mm -hmm. on the south side. Okay. It's out in 12th in California not far from 26th in Cal. And, you know, Nellie Vasquez, look at it, talk with her. They have this holistic approach, but they need help. They need to scale it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Paul will come back for sure. I'll be back for sure. Okay. And you come back every week to watch public affairs, not to see me, Berkowitz. I'm nothing. To see guys and ladies like Paul Vallis, oh, yeah. who are running for mayor of the city of Chicago. Well, thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure.